Hello, good morning and welcome everyone to the latest in our Pulse Advisor webinar series. Um, delighted to be joined once again today by our friends from QB Partners. Today we've got Jerry Brown and Scott Hood who will be running through the main presentation slides with you today. Uh, the topic for us is continuing the theme we've had running through for the past few months on estate planning and today looking specifically at UK inheritance tax. So if you are involved with planning with UK connected persons, this will be one of the key pillars which will underpin that planning. I know famously once described as a voluntary tax by a former UK chancellor um, who thought that those who paid the tax despised their heirs more than the UK taxman. Uh, so plenty of planning opportunities. Anticipate that the um, presentation will take in the region of 25 to 30 minutes. And as always, if you do have any questions, there is a Q&A button at the bottom and we'll compile those to run through at the end. So without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Jerry now. Over to you, Jerry. Thanks, Paul. Good morning. I want to talk for a few minutes about the UK inheritance tax context. How do we explain UK inheritance tax to clients? Well, we've had a form of inheritance tax in the UK since 1694. And the tax has undergone various transformations since then, but some of the core principles have remained the same. And those that have changed have evolved very slowly. We've had three main taxes. We've had estate duty in the 1890s, which was the first modern consolidation of all the previous legislation. And then in the 1970s, the Labour government introduced capital transfer tax, which attempted to merge some features of a wealth tax with uh, the old inheritance tax and the state duty principles that then applied. And finally, in 1980, uh, the new or then new Conservative government decided to simplify capital transfer tax. It started off by renaming it as inheritance tax, and then it lessened its impact quite significantly. So I always think it's interesting to go back to appropriate duty. It was introduced by King William III in 1694. And William had a problem. He was newly crowned king. He had to fight a rebellion in Southwest England. He was involved in wars in Scotland and wars in Ireland. And he was originally from Holland, the Netherlands, and he was still involved in wars on the European continent. And these wars were quite expensive and he needed to pay his troops. So we introduced a new tax in the UK called probate duty. And it was a very simple tax. When an individual died, their assets have to pass to their heirs, their successors. And if that involves things like land, then that land has to be registered in the name of the executors and then re-registered in the name of the heirs or successors. So there's a, a formal, formal trail, if you like, of, a, of legal activity transferring those assets from the deceased to the heirs. And William said, well, this is a good point at which to levy a tax. So when the executors presented the documentation for probate, they had to pay five shillings, 25 pence. It was a fixed tax. So time went on, um, William died, his successors kept the tax. And nearly 100 years later, uh, the UK was involved in another war 
the U.S. War of Independence. And that was a much more expensive war. Uh, it was fought 4,000 miles away. There were many more troops involved. They had to be transported from the UK to North America and back. They had to be supplied. So the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time decided to reform probate duty. And instead of it fixed 25 shillings, sorry, 25 pence, he introduced a graduated tax. And that simply meant the bigger your estate, the more tax you paid. And that principle has applied virtually since that time. So I'm not going to go into the history of all the various uh, reorganizations of probate duty and death duties and inheritance tax over the years. But there are two important problems that uh, we have to deal with or more appropriately, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and his staff have to deal with. Imagine you're the Chancellor and you're designing an IHT system. There are two major problems. The first one is, what do you do about people who avoid the tax by making gifts on their deathbed? Or perhaps more realistically, in the last couple of years of their life, if the tax is simply levied on the assets, the wealth at time of death, then you as chancellor are going to lose out quite a bit of income. And the second problem that you have is, what are you going to do about people who sign over assets to their children, grandchildren whatsoever, but retain use of those assets? And the normal example given here is someone who signs over a holiday home to uh, their children perhaps, but continues to visit every few months for a, a long weekend. They have transferred legal ownership to their children, but they have retained beneficial ownership or economic ownership, economic benefits. So this has caused chancellors great problems over the years. The first problem with deathbed gifts, the original idea was that gifts made within one year of death were added into the estate when calculating any tax due. And that period of one year has changed from time to time. It's been two years, it's been three years, it's been five years, and currently it is seven years. So gifts made in the seven years before death are currently taken into account in calculating IHT. And what about the second problem, uh, gifting legal ownership, but retaining some sort of benefit? Well, governments have realized that this has been a problem since uh, the mid 19th century. And estate duty, which was the tax which ran from the early 1890s through to the 1970s, had legislation to stop this avoidance practice. And if you kept a, made a gift but kept some sort of economic benefit from that gift, then the gifted asset was treated as being in your IHT estate, treated as being subject to inheritance tax. And when the Conservatives, when Nigel Lawson, who was the Chancellor, uh, reformed capital transfer tax and introduced inheritance tax, they forgot about gifts with reservation of benefit. And for a two-year period from 1984 to 1986, it was possible to make gifts, avoid IHT, but still retain a benefit from those gifts. And then the Inland Revenue, as it was then, the Capital Taxes Office managed to persuade the Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, that if he didn't do something to close this huge loophole, the, the tax would be effectively meaningless. So we have very strict rules on gifts with reservation of benefit. <clears throat> 
if you reserve any benefit whatsoever in a gift, then the gifted asset is treated as remaining in your IHT estate. And the third area which um, I want to touch on very briefly is what do we do about business assets? The original idea was that um, business assets should be exempt from uh, estate duty and that has carried on through the succeeding 100 years. We've got various and had various types of relief for business assets and currently and by currently I mean in the last 40 odd years we've had relief at the rate of 100 percent so business assets are effectively exempt from IHT and the legislation is carefully drafted so that only business assets qualify for the relief investment type assets don't qualify and that causes some issues with HMRC at the moment and um, there are regularly cases before the tax tribunal on things like holiday lettings are they investments or are they trades and it's very difficult to draw the line between the two but the current feature of our system is that business assets are not taxed and that is extended through to agricultural assets. So if you own vast swathes of farmland in the north of Scotland and have a tenant farmer or two working the land, then you as landowner um, effectively again escape IHT. So I, I want to pass over to Scott now who's going to talk in a bit more detail about some of the topics I've mentioned. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so uh, a quote from Norman Cousins, uh, history is a vast early warning system. So I think it's really worth reflecting there on, um, on what Jerry said for people looking at what inheritance tax might look like in the future. It's really important, I think, to look at uh, where we've come from on that. But turning now then to, um, to the present, what I'd like to do is run through uh, the headlines of inheritance tax as it is today and also illustrate that with some um, relatively straightforward calculations. Um, and uh, for those paying attention, there will also be a test somewhere near the end. Um, but we'll come to that in a bit. So um, if we can switch to the headlines first of all then, please. Um, so for each of these headlines, I'd like to say these are broadly correct most of the time. However, underneath all of these is a complex web of exceptions and nuance but starting with uh, with each one on its face then inheritance tax is a death um, is a tax sorry on death and on lifetime transfers and Jerry's mentioned there about the design of that and why that's why that's the case um, broadly assets on death that are below 325,000 pounds are subject to inheritance tax at 0%. So they're not tax-free, but they're effectively tax-free. Um, and that, um, that is known as the nil rate band. Um, where you have a married couple, so headline number three on the top right, where you have a married couple or a civil partnered couple, and one of the couple doesn't use uh, their nil rate band in full, then it can be transferred to the survivor for that person to use on, on their death. Um, moving to the bottom row, Assets on death above the nil rates band are subject to inheritance tax at 40%. Um, and then moving across, uh, assets um, that are worldwide assets for UK domiciles, and I know we've touched on domicile in a previous presentation, uh, is worldwide assets are subject to UK inheritance tax for UK domiciles. And finally, even for non-UK domiciles, um, UK inheritance tax applies to UK CITUS assets. So, as I say, those are the broad headlines, mostly correct most of the time. Um, but in terms of just illustrating some exceptions there, um, if you've, um, uh, if, for example, you're a non-UK domicile, uh, but happen to spend more than the required period, 15 tax years, resident in the UK out of the previous 20, um, 
then you can be deemed to be non-UK domiciled. So that tax, that tax net expands a little wider. Um, in addition, IHT, we say there is a tax on death and on lifetime gifts, but there's also an extension to that with certain trusts in the inheritance tax can apply to trusts on an ongoing basis. I suppose really it's an extension of the tax on lifetime gifts, but also applies to uh, uh, types of trust is set up on death as well. So it's not just on death and lifetime gifts, it also extends to certain trusts on an ongoing basis. Um, so it is it is more complex than the headlines would uh, would say. Um, so what I'd like to do now is illustrate that in a in a in a simple uh, ish calculation. Um, and we're looking at an example here of, of Mr. Smith, who's a UK domicile. So that's important because as we just said, Mr. Smith's UK's um, sorry worldwide assets will be included within the inheritance tax calculation for him on his death. So in this example, uh, Mr. Smith has got a, a worldwide estate of 1.1 million pounds. From this, we can deduct the nil rate band that I mentioned, the amount that's taxed at 0% of 325,000 pounds, which leaves an amount taxable at 40% of 775,000 um, pounds. This leaves a UK inheritance tax bill of £310,000, which as a proportion of the estate is over a quarter, it's about 28% of the estate would therefore be um, charged uh, to, well, sorry, a, a bill of 28% uh, would be paid to HMRC. Um, and th that raises, I suppose, a, a couple of further issues from a planning perspective when you're speaking to your advice, uh, speaking to your clients. Um, <clears throat> some clients are gonna be more sensitive to this issue than others. Um, I've spoken to people in the past who are not particularly worried about an inheritance tax bill being paid by their children. They think it's fair enough. Um, other clients, though, are worried about that and they wouldn't want their, their children to have to bear that kind of loss from their inheritance. Um, and you get sort of shades in between. So it, it, I think it's important to raise this issue with clients, even if just to um, record what their decision is and to review it in future. The other issue that even if the clients aren't that interested in the tax bill itself, in order for the estate to pass, let's take England and Wales, for example, and Ger has touched on this before, in order for the estate to pass to the beneficiaries, there will need to be a grant from the court effectively, um, giving the legal personal representatives of the estate the ability to deal with that estate. So um, in order to get that grant, the tax needs to be paid, and if the tax isn't paid, then uh, there will be a delay then in dealing with the estate. So even for clients who are less concerned about tax, they might be concerned about delay. So again, it's really important to have that conversation with them to highlight that um, a tax bill could, could lead to a delay in dealing with the estate. Um, but as I say, it's, there's lots of nuance and lots of uh, lots of complications. So if we can look at the, some of that nuance and, and complication now, um, for Mr. Smith's estate, there might be some reasons why inheritance tax is uh, is less, or even that there might be no inheritance tax at all on that particular estate. Um, if we start then with some exemptions, so if Mr. Smith was married, for example, or had a civil partner, let's say he was married, and he left all of that uh, estate to his wife, there would be no inheritance tax on his death, provided she was a UK domicile. And that's quite logical, really, because um, it's just really deferring the issue until his wife were to later pass away, um, because as a UK domicile, her estate would be subject to UK inheritance tax. Similarly, if um, Mr. Smith were to have left his entire estate to charity, um, provided the charity met the re relevant requirements from HMRC's perspective um, regarding where it's registered, how it's registered, how it's governed, that kind of thing, um, then the, uh, the gift to charity on death uh, would be exempt for inheritance tax. So there's a potential there for no inheritance tax to be paid. Uh, there are also reliefs. Um, Jerry has touched on those as well with agricultural property relief and business property relief, um, which provide the relief from inheritance tax. Um, there's also an additional nil rate band on top of the £325,000 nil rate band called the residence nil rate band. Uh, this is a relatively new invention. Um, we'll go into a little bit more detail later on it, but broadly it's an additional nil rate band where someone leaves their home that they own to a direct descendant. And then finally, um, there's the transferable nil rate band, which is available on both the residence nil rate band and the standard um, nil rate band. Uh, where it's unused on the first of a couple to die. So if Mr. Smith was a widower, for example, he might well have inherited 
a transferable nil rate band that could reduce or, or eliminate any inheritance tax. Um, what I'd like to do there is park the death position for now and then look at some um, other uh, issues around inheritance tax. Um, two main planning options then with inheritance tax during life are to look at exempt or relieved assets. And the other one then is to make gifts, make lifetime transfers. So I would like to touch on now uh, some issues around making li lifetime transfers. There are three types of lifetime transfer for the purpose of inheritance tax. Um, they're either going to be exempt, potentially exempt or chargeable lifetime transfers. And you might want to look at this as a kind of traffic light system um, with uh, exempt being green, potentially exempt being amber and chargeable being red. So exempt transfers, as far as the person making the gift is concerned, um, they are not chargeable to inheritance tax. It's green um, and won't be as far as they're concerned. Um, when it comes to a potentially exempt transfer, they're not taxable for inheritance tax at the time they're made. But if the uh, person making the gift doesn't survive for seven years, then they can then be charged to inheritance tax. So that's why they're potentially exempt. At the point that they're made, we just don't know whether they'll be exempt or not. And finally, then there are chargeable lifetime transfers. So at the point these are made, we know that they will be chargeable to inheritance tax. Whether they're charged is a, is a slightly different question, uh, but they're certainly chargeable to inheritance tax. A final point on this then is that when we're looking at lifetime transfers, Inheritance tax operates on what's called the loss to the estate principle. So how much of the estate is actually lost as a result of the transaction. Um, and um, that's really important then when you're looking at valuing the amount of the transfer that's made during life, because that can have some, um, some impacts. So I'd like to look at each of those types of transfers in a bit more detail now. And we'll move on then to the exempt transfers, first of all. So some examples of those. Um, one I've already touched on in relation to death, but it applies during life as well, is that a gift to a UK domiciled spouse or civil partner is exempt from inheritance tax. Um, and that, of course, is, is a, a, from a practical perspective, incredibly useful for couples that are UK domiciled and, uh, and married or, or civil partners. Um, if you have couples of mixed domicile, then that is one to watch out for because there isn't that total exemption. There's also the annual £3,000 exemption from inheritance tax as well, um, and that can be a very useful planning tool. So um, this is per donor, so it's not per recipient, uh, but each year, each tax year, everybody's got the ability to give £3,000 exempt of inheritance tax to, to other people. Um, and if you imagine a couple, let's say, uh, that are looking to make some longer term inheritance tax planning, they could give £3,000 a year each to their children. And if they did that over a period of 10 years, that's £60,000 that they've gifted from their estate exempt of IHT. And that might provide them the, the children if they were to invest that money with some liquidity, perhaps to pay a bill in the future. Um, the next uh, exemption that I will talk about there is the normal expenditure from income exemption. There aren't any fixed numbers around this, but broadly, as long as the uh, payment from the person making the transfer is, um, is out of income, not capital, is normal, regular, and doesn't affect their standard of living, then that too will be exempt from inheritance tax. So very, very useful exemptions. Moving across to potentially exempt transfers then. Um, so these are ones where we don't know whether they'll be exempt or not. Um, examples of this are gifts to another individual to the extent that they're not exempt already, um, or gifts to a bear trust. So a bear trust, very simple trust for one or more beneficiaries, absolutely no ifs, no buts. Um, and those are potentially exempt transfers. <clears throat> so in order for the um, transfer to be exempt, the donor, the person making the transfer, must survive for seven years or more from the date that the gift is made. If they don't, then it's not potentially exempt anymore, it's chargeable. If it falls within the nil rate band, then there would be no inheritance tax to pay on that specific gift. But if it exceeds the nil rate band, based on the value when the gift is made, there is a form of relief on that, depending on how long it is since the gift was made within that seven years. Um, but from the point of view of your client, at the point they make the potentially exempt transfer, it's not taxable to IHT at the point the transfer is made. In terms of extra administration, though, it is worth bearing in mind that um, the trusts now, many trusts now are uh, becoming reportable uh, in the UK. For example, you've got the trustee registration service. Um, so it's, it's important to be aware of any reporting that needs to be done in respect of, of the creation of a trust. Um, if we move on then to the next um, and final set of transfers, um, these are chargeable lifetime transfers. 
And, and the main example of this is a gift to a discretionary trust. A discretionary trust is a trust where the trustees essentially have discretion within a class as to who gets the benefits from the trust. So it might be my children and my grandchildren and the trustees decide which of my children and grandchildren get the benefits. So broadly then, um, there are a number of charges uh, to inheritance tax with a chargeable lifetime transfer during life. There's the, uh, the entry charge, and that can be up to 20% uh, IHT on the creation of the trust, on the, on the transfer to the trust. Um, death within seven years, just like a potentially exempt transfer, can create an inheritance tax liability. Um, and there's also an ongoing periodic charge on a 10 year cycle, which can cause an inheritance tax charge of up to 10% every 10 years, or proportionately if capital leaves that trust, in the case of a discretionary trust, within the 10 year period. And again, it's really important to consider the administration, the reporting um, around creating gifts like this, okay? Um, so um, that's broadly it then for the, um, the, the, lifetime, the, the lifetime gifts um, in terms of what I want to tell you. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just to see how much you've retained on that. So we're going to do a quick quiz and a poll if the technology allows. Um, and we've got here five questions. And I'd like you to use your voting buttons in a moment to answer the questions as best you can um, to look at these five scenarios. So scenario one, um, we're going to use the example of Mrs. Evans, and she's going to make the following transactions in this tax year. So in May last year, um, she made a, a gift of £1,000 to her best friend, Mrs. Jones. So simply on, on your uh, uh, Zoom keypad things, if you can select either A, B, C or D as to whether that's an exempt transfer, a potentially exempt transfer, chargeable lifetime transfer, or whether there was no transfer at all. Um, and the same options apply to the other four questions. So question B, in July 2021, um, she makes a loan of £100,000 to a discretionary trust. That's uh, number C, uh, sorry, letter C, August 2021, she makes a £500,000 gift to her um, UK domiciled husband. Question D, in September 2021, uh, she makes a gift of £250,000 to a Beatrice Trust for her two children. And finally, E, in October 2021, she makes a £500,000 gift to a discretionary trust. So I'll leave you for a minute or so there just to have a go at answering those, those questions on, on the screen. I'll wait for perhaps Steve to give me a nod when we've got lots of, um, lots of answers in. I think we're just about 30 seconds, Scott. We've got quite a few coming in, so just, uh, okay, just sure. one second. Thanks, Steve. Okay, I'll share the, uh, share the results now. Okay. Great, thanks, Steve. And I'll just talk through the uh, through the answers there. So, sorry, Steve. Are we move to the next slide for the answers yet, or a bit longer? Ah, perfect. OK, so just to run through the answers then. Um, so the first question then, in May 2021, uh, Mrs. Jones makes a gift to her best friend of £1,000. So that would be an exempt transfer because that falls within the £3,000 annual exemption, um, assuming that she's not already used it and there's nothing to suggest that she has. Um, the second question then, um, a little bit tricky because this one was a loan, not a gift. So there was no loss to the estate in this situation. Nothing was nothing was lost uh, because the loan could have been recorded at any time. Um, so there's no transfer that takes place in that one. So that, the answer to that one is D. Um, question C. So because Mr. and Mrs. Evans are both UK domiciled, that's an exempt transfer to spouse. Um, question number D, uh, question D, um, that's a gift to a bear trust. So that would be a potentially exempt transfer. Uh, it exceeds the £3,000 annual exemption. 
So that would be a potentially exempt transfer, but almost all of it would. Um, and finally, uh, the last one is a chargeable lifetime transfer because that is a gift to a discretionary trust. So anyway, I hope that, uh, hope that was, uh, was useful. Uh, if we can move on then to the next slide, just recurring that returning then to the um, uh, death situation then. So this is one other uh, nil rate band I'd like to touch on briefly. This is the residence nil rate band. It's only available on death. It's relatively recent uh, coming in. I think it's around 2017. Um, and what it allows is if you've got a home uh, that you own, you can pass it to your direct descendants uh, and achieve an additional £175,000 of nil rate band on death. Um, in addition to the, uh, the, the, the standard nil rate band, the residence nil rate band can also be transferred to a surviving spouse or civil partner if it's not used on first death. It isn't available for lifetime transfers. And there's a little quirk to be aware of that uh, if your estate or if a person's estate exceeds £2 million pounds on death, then the residence nil rate band is reduced on a tapering basis by one pound for every two pounds that the estate exceeds that two million threshold. So it, where you're doing inheritance tax planning and bringing an estate down for a client, it can actually sometimes increase the residence, the availability of the residence nil rate band as well. So a double, double benefit. Um, downsizing adds a lot of complexities, however, we won't, won't go into that today. We just haven't got the time. But I think it's worth um, mentioning this because it was heralded a few years ago that um, there's a potential for a couple to leave a million pounds on death to the next generation. And I think it's really important to realise how that million pounds is made up. It's made up of a mixture of the standard nil rate band of 325,000 plus this additional nil rate band for the residents. And if we look at the next uh, next calculation, next example, we'll go through an example of that now as to how, going back to Mr Smith, um, we can actually significantly reduce or eliminate an inheritance tax uh, situation depending on the assets and reliefs available. So this is the same Mr. Smith with the same asset, uh, sorry, the same estate of 1.1 million pounds. However, here we look at more closely at the breakdown of those assets and more about his situation. So here the home is gonna go to his direct descendants, let's say his children of 350,000 pounds. He's also got 100,000 pounds worth of business property relieved assets. And finally, he's got £650,000 of other types of investments, um, investment accounts, bank accounts, whatever. So if we then go through the steps, we can deduct the, the nil rate band of £325,000, that's his, his residence nil rate band, because he's leaving a home to his direct descendants. Um, he's a widower in this case, so we can transfer the unused nil rate band from his late wife, and likewise her residence nil rate band as well giving us a total deduction there um, effectively of a, th uh, of a million pounds. Uh, the taxable estate therefore is 100,000, but 100,000 pounds of assets were business relievable at 100%, which leaves an inheritance tax liability of zero. Quite a contrast from the 310,000 pounds worth of liability from earlier. Same client, just slightly different uh, mix in terms of calculating the, uh, the outcome. Um, so, um, I think broadly that's it. Um, in terms of speaking with your clients, I think it's worth to telling them stories about inheritance tax, as Jerry has done, to, um, to give them the context as to why it's important. Um, when you're looking at the discussions with clients, I think it's important to know who owns the assets, whether they're uh, relievable from inheritance tax, um, where the assets will pass on death, for example, under the will, uh, whether there are exemptions, such as spouse exemption or civil partnership exemptions, whether the residence nil rate band will be available, any transferable nil rate bands available and what your clients are to make uh, plans to make lifetime gifts and how concerned they are about inheritance tax. So I'll just leave you with that thought, uh, but thank you very much indeed for your time. I'll hand back over to Paul. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Jerry. Uh, very informative as always, and uh, with a cheeky quiz thrown in as well. I'm sure uh, we, we, won't, we won't share the results with the audience. We'll, uh, we'll keep them private for now. But um, yeah, we, we've got a comment came through during the session from Paul, which mirrors um, a question I've actually got through from one of our guys down in, in, in Spain, Scott, um, in, in two parts, really. The first part is where there's a, a, a non-UK domiciled spouse involved in, in, in the scenario. Um, obviously, with a UK domicile, you can pass the estate in its entirety using the 
the exemption to, to the spouse. What happens in a situation where you've got a UK domicile who's married to a non-UK domicile? Are there any reliefs or exemptions available there? Sure. That, thanks. That's a really important point. Um, so where you've got a UK domicile who's passing assets either on life or on death um, to a non-UK domiciled spouse, um, you still get the standard nil rate band, £325,000. Um, there is in addition a spouse exemption. Uh, it's also equal to the standard nil rate band, so another £325,000. So in a typical situation, it'd be possible for the UK domiciled spouse to pass um, £650,000 then to the uh, spouse without inheritance tax. That's 350000 as a nil rate band and six, uh, 300, sorry, 325000 pounds as a nil rate band and 325000 as a spouse exemption. But if it was a gift during life, for example, the remainder of that is likely to be a potentially exempt transfer. Um, so it is really, really worth uh, uh, sort of yeah, raising that with clients where there is that mix of domiciles between them. OK, and the sec second part of the question is, if the individual also has to face the equivalent of UK IHT in their local country of residence, if there's a double taxation agreement with uh, the UK in that country, can you get a credit for any death taxes paid locally against the UK inheritance tax bill? Yeah, it is. It is possible under the that you need to consider the double taxation agreement that's in place. But uh, and there aren't that many when it comes to inheritance tax as compared with other types of taxes like income tax. But there are a few treaties out there for inheritance tax. Um, but there's also the possibility of getting unilateral relief anyway with a, for a credit. Um, and it's worth investigating, investigating both of those uh, with, the, with the, the client's tax advisors, really. Great stuff. Great. I'm just going to have one last check into the question button. I think, I think that's exhausted the questions uh, for today. So uh, thanks. Thanks for answering those, Scott. Pleasure. Um, yeah, that just leaves me to say to everyone, thanks for tuning in today. As, as ever, there will be a recording available of today's session. So if you want to go back and reassess any of the things covered by Scott and Jerry, that will be available within the next 48 hours for you to access. And indeed, if you have any colleagues who couldn't make it to the session today and you think they might find this useful, of course, feel free to share that with them. Uh, speaking with Steve in our marketing team, there will be an invite going out for our next webinar in the next couple of weeks time. So watch out for that one in your inbox. But in the meantime, before that, we will be sending out our next Pulse newsletter in the next week or so. And as always, that will be um, having some topical information for you to access there. So once again, thank you to Scott and Jerry. Thank you very much for your expertise today. And in the meantime, Thank you, everyone, for your uh, time today and see you next time. Thank you.